Good evening. My name is Scott Moore, and I would like to welcome you to the SOS Summer of Survival webinar series. I have been asked tonight to answer the question, does archery have a place in a survival or preparedness scenario? And of course, I feel that the answer to that question is absolutely. Tonight, I'm going to discuss how to choose the proper archery equipment the use of archery equipment for hunting and food procurement, the use of archery equipment from a tactical perspective, and why archery equipment at times can be better than firearms. And lastly, I will discuss the making of field expedient archery gear. First and foremost, how to choose the proper archery equipment. As far as bows are concerned, we first have to make a decision if we're going to go with a traditional bow, a compound bow, or a crossbow, I'm going to say that my choice, hands down, for archery equipment for a survival situation is going to be a traditional bow. With that meaning a self bow, a long bow, or a recurve bow. And the reason, very simply, is because a compound bow or a crossbow for the most part has moving parts that need maintained that we would not be able to repair ourselves in the field without some specialized equipment. And with a traditional bow there's few moving parts, there's very little that can go wrong with that bow, and it's easy to maintain. So as we start discussing the different types of traditional bows, we start with a self bow, which is very simply a bow that has been carved out of a piece of wood. I'm going to call this a last resort. The next bow up in the line would be a modern manufactured laminated long bow. This is a very good bow, it's very consistent, it's very easy to shoot but it has the limitations of its length. It cannot be broken into a smaller package, so you have to be able to transport it and handle it and deal with it as is. So for that reason, this would be my second choice. My first choice, and the bow that I would prefer in a survival situation, would be a modern takedown recurve bow. This bow is very easy to shoot. It's the most powerful of the traditional bows, and the takedown feature on this bow makes it very easy to pack and transport. This bow consists of a handle or riser, two limbs, and a string. The way that this bow is designed, this bow can be put together and taken apart in the field without tools. We simply loosen the limb bolt. We grab the appropriate limb. We put this limb in place. Insert the limb bolt through the limb. Tighten this down, hand tight, and you can in just a few moments assemble your bow and have this bow ready to go as a functional weapon. As you see as we're sitting here talking, this has just taken a few minutes, and I now have this bow ready to string up and use. I take this bow apart very quickly. All we have to do is loosen these limb bolts, take the limbs off. While I have this riser in my hand, I'm going to point out to you the benefits of a recurve for accurate shooting. The handle on this riser is shaped to be gripped in a very consistent manner. 
so it'll give you consistency when you're shooting. The shelf on this bow is cut to center. Because your arrow is traveling through the center of the bow, instead of being cast off to the side, which a lot of bows are, it makes it very easy, easy to shoot this bow accurately, and it also makes a multitude of different shafts shoot well out of the same bow. So again, my final answer on what is the proper bow for a survival or preparedness situation, I'm going hands down with a takedown recurve bow. Now once we get past the point of deciding which bow we're going to use, the couple of questions that need answered are number one, how long is this bow going to be and how powerful is this bow going to be as far as draw weight. There are some very short bows on the market, as short as 48 to 52 inches, that are very appealing because of their compactness. But from the standpoint of accurate shooting, I would steer away from bows that are that short. I would stick with a takedown recurve bow that is 58 to 62 inches long. As far as the poundage of the bow goes, the average adult male can handle shooting a 40 to 45 pound bow without too much difficulty even if he has not been shooting archery a long time. A 40 to 45 pound recurve bow is powerful enough to do what we want it to do and yet it is not so powerful as to be hard to shoot and there are reasons that you might not consider that make it advantageous to have a bow that is not quite so powerful. If you're shooting say a 60 pound bow and you miss your mark and your arrow hits a hard object such as a tree or a rock, you can just about guarantee that you're going to end up with a damaged arrow that is no longer of any use. If you stick with a bow around 40, 45 pounds you can shoot that bow more accurately. Your arrows have less of a tendency to shoot through your targets. If you miss your target and you hit a hard object, your arrows have a much better chance of surviving that blow and being able to be used on subsequent hunting adventures. All right, now that we have our bow of choice and we're satisfied with our weapon, there's a few pieces of equipment that we need to protect ourselves so that we can shoot this weapon comfortably. First and foremost, as we pull this bow back to shoot it, we want to protect our arm from being hit by the string, so we're going to need an arm guard. So I have a simple leather arm guard here that I use all the time. Put this on real quick. So now we have protection from the bowstring, hitting our arm. Now, the hand that we shoot the bow with, we need protection on our fingers so that our fingers are not burned by the string through repeated shooting. We basically have a choice between a glove and a tab. The glove encompasses your entire fingers, gives you a lot of protection from the string, but the two things that I personally don't like about a glove is first and foremost you lose the dexterity in your fingers to grip and do other things. You kind of lose your fine motor skills while you're wearing this glove. The reason I prefer a tab, and this is just a piece of leather that is cut to the right shape, this goes on my ring finger that when I grab my bow and pull it back, this goes on the string and protects my fingers from the string. The other thing I like about a tab is when I'm not actually going to make a shot, I can simply turn this tab around on my finger and I can use my hand and maintain my dexterity and fine motor skills. Now in a minute, I'm going to get into the arrows and the different types of arrows and what type of arrow you might prefer to have in a survival situation. 
but before I talk about arrows, I want to talk about quivers. The first quiver that I want to discuss is a back quiver. And this is the quiver that has all the nostalgia and romance attached to it. But it is not necessarily the best quiver. The benefit of this quiver is that it holds a very large amount of arrows. This quiver goes across your shoulder. It's on your back. It's out of your way. Your hands are free. Holds a lot of arrows. But to get the arrows out, you have to reach back, grab an arrow, and pull it out. Also, these arrows clatter, make quite a bit of noise in this quiver, and they're sticking out above your head, and they tend to get caught in the brush and rattle and bang around. Now, as you're stalking through the woods, you can swing this quiver around, cradle it under your arm, and kind of guide it through the brush and keep it quiet. But again, the benefits of this quiver is you can hold a lot of arrows. The disadvantages of this quiver are your arrows are sticking up above your head, they get caught in the brush, they rattle around, they make noise, and most importantly, if you're wearing a backpack, the back quiver just doesn't do well with the backpack. So it holds a lot of arrows, it's a good place to store your arrows in camp, but to actually carry out in the field hunting, might be some limitations to the back quiver. The next quiver that I'm going to discuss is just a side quiver. I have just made this side quiver out of a wool blanket, trimmed it with some leather. This quiver just hangs on the belt and literally hangs at your side. It holds a lot of arrows. You can hold this quiver in your hand as you're walking and kind of cradle the arrows and keep them from rattling around. You can kind of steer the end of your arrows through the brush as you're walking. It's not in the way of a backpack. So there are a lot of advantages to a side quiver, and I use one quite a bit. The third type of quiver that I want to discuss, and the one that I use the most often, is a bow quiver that literally straps right to your bow. This bow quiver is very light, it's very small, it doesn't take up much room. The limitation is that it only holds four or five arrows, so you can't take a lot of arrows with you. But the upside is they are ready at hand when you need them. They're not in the way of anything else. It's a nice tight package with your bow. And I just really prefer a bow quiver. This is my actual hunting bow that I hunt with all the time. Any of you that have watched my videos, you've seen me using this bow to uh, successfully hunt deer and hogs. This is the very quiver I just showed you on the bow. And as you can see, it makes a real streamline tight package on the bow, very little weight, it doesn't affect the way I shoot at all, and when I need an arrow, the arrow is right here at hand and very accessible. So again, the back quiver, you can carry a lot of arrows, but you have to contend with them being on your back, making some noise, it kind of interferes with a backpack. The side quiver can go right on your side, you can keep a hold of your arrows, you can maneuver them through brush, you can kind of keep them quiet, it again holds a lot of arrows. If you have the option of bringing gear with you, such as in a preparedness situation, I would highly recommend the bow quiver. That would be your best bet for keeping your arrows safe, the sharp broadheads protected, and have your arrows where you need them, when you need them. I am now going to start discussing arrows as they are the most vital link in an archery system. I'm going to discuss the different materials that arrows are made out of. I'm going to discuss the knocks, the feathers, the points. As I get into the various types of small game and large game hunting points, we are going to segue into using archery for hunting and food procurement. Just to show you an example of the different arrows and the different materials that they are made out of, we start with simply a sharp stick with a knock slot on one end and this end carved to a point. We progress from there to a primitive arrow 
that does have fletching tied on in a stone point that is hafted on the front end with pine pitch, hide glue, and sinew. From that point, we progress to a wooden arrow that is made with modern tooling that is designed for arrow manufacture. From this point, we progress to the aluminum arrow, which enables you to have different points that screw onto the end. In the final progression from the aluminum arrow is the arrow that is most commonly available today, and that is a carbon arrow that is made out of a hollow tube of carbon fibers. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get a close-up of these arrows, and we're going to start discussing the different components and the various options that are available to you in a survival or preparedness scenario. When we start talking about shafting material, of the three choices being wood, aluminum, or carbon, wood is most definitely the oldest shaft material known to man. The drawbacks of a wood shaft are they're less durable, they're prone to warping, breakage, but they can definitely be used as a functional arrow shaft. From a preparedness standpoint, I think we're dealing just about specifically with aluminum or carbon. I am not necessarily recommending the new carbon arrows as a go-to arrow shaft material for a preparedness situation. The reason is this. To make and maintain a carbon arrow, it requires some specialty tools and a little bit of training to deal with the components in the glues and the various aspects of making and maintaining a carbon arrow. The aluminum arrow shafts are not as readily available, but for the use that we're discussing in this webinar, I would think long and hard about using the old style aluminum arrow shafts that have a swedged knock taper on the end and I'll tell you specifically why this is an advantage. When we're dealing with knocks in today's industry with the carbon arrows we are dealing with what is called a pin knock. These carbon shafts as with the aluminum are hollow and these knocks have a pin that is inserted into the hollow back end of the carbon shaft. That makes a very neat system. You don't need glue. You can rotate the knock on the shaft to make alignment adjustments with your shafting. But the problem with this setup is if you are in a situation where you have limited resources, no way to go to the sporting goods store to buy more, and you have to maintain the six or ten or twelve arrow shafts that you have and use them over a long period of time. If when practicing or any other shooting you shoot one arrow and then when you shoot your second arrow you put the point of the arrow into the knock and break it or else you shoot two arrows that slap together and break one of these knocks off flush with the carbon shaft with the pin still embedded in the carbon shaft you have just about rendered that arrow useless. It's very difficult without the proper tools to remove that pin without damaging the shaft and then replacing that knock. The other drawback to uh, carbon arrows if you're with limited tools and resources is that to cut this carbon shaft to length requires a high speed saw blade so that the end doesn't tear and fray and splinter. The reasons I'm suggesting possibly it is worth getting some of the old style aluminum shafts 
is because with this old style aluminum shaft with the swedged knock taper you have glue on knocks that fit this taper and if you break or destroy or damage this knock you can scrape and clean off this tapered aluminum cone and replace it with a new knock. This is going to be the one component of your arrows that are going to be the most likely to receive damage and need replacing to maintain your arrow's integrity as a useful shaft. Also these knocks are very inexpensive. You can get a hundred of these for just about ten dollars and that will get you a lot of shooting in. The other benefit to this aluminum shaft if you need to sh cut this shaft to length maybe you've damaged the end of it and you want to cut it back and make a shorter shaft for a woman or a child to shoot you can cut this shaft with a hacksaw if you have to and clean up the edges or the most effective way to do it with a tool that you have at the house is just to simply use a tubing cutter. With a tubing cutter you can make precise cuts on these aluminum shafts and leave the end of them nice and clean so that uh, you can put the proper components in place and everything will fit nice, true, and snug. I'm now going to go ahead and start showing you all the components to put the arrow together from the knock moving forward to the point. I want to start our discussion about feathers by talking about the different materials that feathers are made out of. Most of the feathers on today's arrows that are purchased at the store to be shot out of compound bows are fletched with a plastic fletching that is normally fairly small. And I don't recommend this for shooting out of a recurve or traditional bow for several reasons. Your traditional bow is going to be shot off of this shelf right here and you have a rug rest and a side plate. This is beneficial because there are no moving parts, nothing to break. This can be maintained and these pieces can be replaced with household items. But to shoot an arrow with plastic veins on it, what this plastic vein is going to have a tendency to do is skip up off that rest as it goes past and it causes erratic arrow flight and it's difficult to tune the bow and to shoot that bow accurately. When we're dealing with feathers, these feathers do what they were designed to do as they pass over this shelf they're going to collapse and give you a much smoother arrow flight and launch off of the shelf of this bow. Now as far as the feathers go there are different shapes. This shape feather right here is called a parabolic shape. The parabolic shape is very quiet. It is probably the most popular shape used. The other shape we have here is more traditional. This is called a shield cut feather. And the shield cut feather sometimes is a little bit noisier in flight. Another variation of fletching that we have is called a flu flu. The flu flu arrow is designed for being shot into the air. It's for aerial shooting and it uses four to six full height uncut feathers to create enough wind drag that the arrow will not go too far when it's shot up in the air. Another variation of the flu flu arrow right here. This is one continuous long feather that is wrapped spirally around the shaft. And this gives you a good example of the various types of feather fletching. But for the most part, we're going to deal with using three parabolic or shield cut feathers on our arrow shafts. I now want to talk about the front end of the arrow and discuss the various methods of attaching points based on what shafting material we're dealing with. I have several components 
laying here on the table that I want to discuss. We have right here an insert that gets glued into the end of aluminum or carbon arrows to receive screw-on points. We have adapters here, both metal and aluminum, that the glue-on points can be glued to to be screwed into this insert. We also have right here examples of some screw-on practice points and hunting heads. And this right here is some glue-on practice points and hunting heads. If we start with a wooden arrow shaft, we have to put a taper on the end of this shaft that will receive these glue-on points. We have a taper tool that is very similar to a pencil sharpener. The end of this wooden shaft goes into the taper tool. The shaft is rotated and it cuts the perfect taper on the end of this shaft, which by the way is a five degree taper. That is the industry standard which will accept any glue on point that is purchased commercially. And these points will go right off the end of that taper and you have a nice point connection there. To put these on permanently, you simply use a hot melt glue and a heat source. You melt this glue, you would put it on the taper, and when you put your field point or hunting point on, uh, give it a little spin, make sure it's on there true, and you have a good connection of your point onto a wooden shaft. Now when we are dealing with aluminum and carbon shafts, we are dealing with a shafting material that is a hollow tube. So we have here an insert that glues into the front end of the arrow shaft and then gives you a point of connection so that you can take a screw-on practice point or hunting head and this will simply screw on to the end of this shaft and you now have your point attached and this gives you the option with one single arrow to put a practice point on a practice and then later put a hunting point on to go into the field and try to collect some game. And that leads me to a discussion of the various types of points and what they're used for and this will also lead into a discussion about hunting and food procurement. And I think I'm going to go ahead and just start by showing you the multitude of different choices for small game heads. Just moving all this out of the way. The purpose of a small game point is twofold. A small game point is generally designed first and foremost to kill a small game animal by basically blunt force trauma. It is also, some of them are designed so that if a shot is missed or if the arrow passes through the game animal that the arrow is hard to lose in the grass and is easy to relocate so that it can be used again. And there are various small game points on the market some of these old, some of these new, and I'll just discuss them one by one. This is a standard small game point that has been used for many years. It is just a blunt. It has a flat surface that is designed to impart a shocking blow when a small game animal is struck. Something that can be made at home in your shop kind of do the same thing. This is nothing more than a screw-on field point that I have put a small washer behind. So when this point is screwed into the arrow, you still have a sharp point, but you also have a flat striking surface created by this washer, which imparts a lot of shock to kill the animal, and it also helps prevent the arrow shaft from passing completely through the animal. Right here is an example of a commercial rendering of the same concept. This is a piece of punched out steel that actually has some 
fins that does some cutting and tissue damage to help in anchoring your game. It again goes right on behind the field point, screwed onto your arrow, and readily adapts your practice point into a small game head. We also have a rubber blunt that just slips over top of an arrow shaft or any point you have on it. These are called bunny busters and they do a reasonably good job of harvesting rabbits and they do a very good job of cushioning the impact if your arrow hits a stump or a rock and it helps preserve your arrow from being broken. This is a very specialized head. It's called a Zwicky Judo Point and this head has spring wire arms on it that are spring loaded so that when this hits in uh, tall grass or brush or anywhere else it, t it tends to stand the arrow up it prevents the arrow from slithering under grass and leaves and debris makes the arrow very hard to lose and this is an extremely effective small game point time tested been around for years and years and years I've personally used these for 20 years and uh, I like them very much. Now as far as broadheads go for hunting larger game, first of all we can just pretty much divide broadheads into several categories. The modern broadhead that is typically used by a compound bow hunter today is a replaceable blade broadhead. This is a broadhead where the components come apart and the blades can be replaced as they are used or damaged. These heads are basically not intended to be resharpened. These heads are intended to be used to shoot a large game animal and from that point forward that head normally needs the blades replaced to continue using. I don't want to say anything disparaging about these modern broadheads but for our intended purpose, getting ready for a survival or a preparedness scenario where we want our gear to last long term with minimal need to purchase more parts, I'm going to rule out these modern replacement blade broadheads. I would highly recommend that we go with broadheads that are solid, one piece. They're typically referred to as glue-on broadheads. And there's basically two kinds. We have here a two-blade broadhead, which is just like a knife blade or a spear point, if you will. And we have a three-blade broadhead, which has multiple blades. To use these broadheads on an aluminum or a carbon arrow, we will need to get an adapter and these heads will have to be glued to the adapter so that the adapter can then be screwed on to an aluminum or a carbon arrow but this is not at all a drawback the system is not hard to put together and it's a very sturdy system that will withstand repeated use with a limited number of broadheads these broadheads you can sharpen them yourselves and as you use them and render them dull and in need of further sharpening it's very easy to resharpen them. These two blade broadheads right here it's very easy to take a small mill file and using this file go ahead and sharpen these broadheads and maintain a sharp edge and take care of any damage that the uh, head might have occurred shooting game. With the three blade broadheads, I'm going to pull one out here I have mounted on a wooden arrow. These three blade broadheads, I realize the color of this one might be kind of hard to see. Very easy to sharpen these three blade broadheads. I simply take a honing stone and I lay this head flat on the stone and sharpening two blades simultaneously make passes on this honing stone 
while rotating the head and it is again very easy for someone on their own in camp to maintain these heads keep them sharp and be able to use them for repeated trips to the field to successfully harvest the game animal. Now as far as archery as a means of hunting and food procurement there are many advantages to archery that might not be considered all the time. First and foremost a bow is generally a silent weapon so you can collect game without alerting other game or any people to your presence. You might be in a situation where you want to hunt game within an urban or rural area where a firearm might be dangerous because of the distance that a bullet can travel, ricochet, things of this nature. Using archery equipment enables you to hunt in and around buildings, vehicles, a populated area and be relatively safe and secure in the knowledge that your arrow is not going to get that far away from you or cause any harm or damage. Also when collecting small game animals or large game animals an arrow does minimal damage to the meat in comparison to a lot of firearms so this also is of great benefit. As far as the specific type of broadheads to be used for game animals I noted earlier that for the average adult male that maybe doesn't pursue archery as a long time field of endeavor, you need to stick with a bow that is around 40 to 45 pounds draw weight. This is going to enable you to shoot accurately, practice without fatigue, it's going to suit you better. A lot of times we have the mindset that something that is more powerful is better but in the case of a recurve bow or a long bow a lot of times that power it hurts accuracy but there are certain broadheads that I'm going to recommend using based on the fact that we are not going to be shooting a lot of poundage to shoot a broadhead such as this which is a three blade broadhead the broadhead itself has more surface area and might possibly take a little bit more power to penetrate if it strikes bone, thick hide, things of this nature. If you're using a bow in the 40-45 pound range you absolutely have enough power to take down a deer, a small boar, but you're going to be better off if you stick with a broadhead such as, I'm going to go ahead and put this on the end of an arrow, you're going to be better off if you stick with a broadhead that has two blades. This broadhead does not require near as much foot-pounds of energy to penetrate because of the sleek profile of the head. And while I'm on the subject of penetration, I'm going to add very quickly that there are several factors that determine how an arrow penetrates in a hunting situation. You have the speed that the arrow is traveling, the physical weight of the arrow, and the configuration of the head on the end of the arrow, and the fourth component that is the most important is how true the arrow is flying. If your bow is well tuned and your arrow is flying laser straight, every bit of force behind that arrow is being directed to the very point where the arrow is making impact and all that energy is being used to penetrate the arrow through the game animal. If your bow is poorly tuned, if your equipment is mismatched and your arrow is flying erratically, if your arrow strikes that animal at an angle and then it's going to be kind of slapping into the animal and then forced to straighten out while penetrating it is going to greatly impede penetration. I will tell you from personal experience that a well-tuned bow that is shooting an arrow with excellent straight arrow flight that is 40-45 pounds is going to penetrate better than a 
70 pound bow if the arrow is flying erratically and striking the game animal at an angle. So my recommendation is to stick with these two blade broadheads that you can sharpen yourself and use a poundage of bow that's light enough that you can very accurately make your shot and keep everything well in hand. I'd like to take just a few minutes right now and discuss why I feel that there are times when archery equipment can be better than firearms. As a weapon, archery equipment is silent, it's portable, lightweight, and compared to firearms, very affordable. We might find a time in this country when firearms are prohibited or outlawed, and archery equipment might very well be legal to own. As of right now, there's no paperwork to buy archery equipment. There's no registration. There's no background check. You can reuse your ammo, provided that you can find and retrieve your arrows. If the skill level is there, you can make archery equipment on site from natural materials, which is something that would be very difficult to do with a firearm. So for these reasons, I feel that there are times when archery equipment can be better than firearms. As far as using archery equipment from a tactical perspective goes, archery equipment can be used as more than a weapon. Archery equipment can be used as a signal device, as a message delivery system, as a tactical distraction, as a retrieval device, and as a sending device. As a signal device, it can be as simple as shooting an arrow into your neighbor's yard. And based on previous communication, a red arrow means one thing and a yellow arrow means another. Just to get someone's attention or to let them know someone's coming, you can shoot an arrow into close proximity of their position. As a message delivery system, you can take that one step further and literally put a note on a piece of paper wrap it around the shaft of the arrow and literally shoot it over to where someone in another position can retrieve it and read the note. As a tactical distraction, think of what it would mean if you could have something like an M80 or a small uh, explosive device that you could shoot a hundred yards away and have go off maybe behind the enemy's position over to a side to distract them. It could simulate gunfire to the point where someone might think that you were going on the defense and trying to flank them. Your imagination is the only limitation to what you could do with that type of scenario. As far as using archery gear from a tactical perspective as a retrieval device, or sending device, I'm going to discuss that in further detail here in just a minute. I'm going to start showing you some archery gear that can be made out of what you have literally in your kitchen, in your shop, in your toolbox, and at that time I'm going to just show you a little bit more about how you can use a bow and arrow for a retrieval device or a sending device. To start my discussion about making archery tackle out of everyday items, I want to start with what I feel would be absolutely the most useful item you could have in a survival situation, and that is a way to shoot an arrow that has a string attached to it so that you can shoot fish or anything in the water, and from a tactical perspective, use that same arrow to retrieve things without exposing yourself, getting out of a covered position, or 
to send a line over a limb or across a ravine to maybe start the process of starting a suspension bridge or getting something lifted up in the air. What I have here is very simply a one pound coffee can and I have taken and made a little handle out of camouflage duct tape so that I can hold this with my bow hand when I'm shooting my bow. I have some line wrapped around the can and I have a bobby pin taped to the edge so that when I wind my string up I can catch it under the bobby pin to hold it in position. I have the string tied to an arrow. This particular arrow is a cane arrow that I made under a primitive situation. And the way to use this is to take and hold this can in your bow hand. Hold your bow in a shooting position. When you load this arrow on your string, you have a situation where you can shoot your bow. The drag of the string on your arrow does not affect the arrow flight at all. And it allows you to shoot fish. You have a bar point. I'll show you that closer in just a minute. And you can pull your fish in. More importantly, as, a, as I mentioned from a tactical perspective, if you need to retrieve something that's out where you do not want to go, you can take and you can shoot this arrow and do one of two things. You can shoot this arrow beyond the item and with the string pull the arrow over the item and hook it and bring it to you or depending on the material and what you're trying to get a hold of you can literally just shoot it and puncture it with the arrow and pull it into you. So my first item I wanted to show you Anybody can do this. We have basically a bow fishing reel made out of a coffee can. Costs next to nothing. Very effective. Works great. And you can also use it to start the process of getting a heavy cable, a heavy rope, or even a chain over a limb, a beam, a girder, or across a ravine, or maybe a stream. And of course it would be a process of shooting this thinner line across, then tying some heavier rope to this and pull it across or over, and then ultimately tie your chain or your cable to the heavier rope and pull it across or over. I'm going to sit down now and just take a closer look at the points that would be on the end of these arrows to do this retrieving type of situation and just start showing you some ways to make some arrows as far as some knocks, some fletching, and some points that you can make with just what you have around your home or in your shop. Alright, I'd like to start my discussion about making archery equipment out of everyday household items by discussing the points. We were just talking about from a tactical perspective using your bow and arrow to maybe retrieve something. I have right here an example of an arrow shaft which is nothing more than some 2 watt hooks lashed to the end of the shaft to make what amounts to a large treble hook. If you have the string and the reel tied to the shaft, I just showed you with the coffee can, you can shoot this beyond an item, drag it over the item, catch it on one of these hooks, and bring it back to you. This here is nothing more than an arrow shaft that has been sharpened to a point and hardened by firing it. This has been charred in the fire to make the wood hard, and this is nothing more than two finished nails that have been driven into the shaft at an angle to create two barbs. In a fishing situation you can shoot a fish with this. The barbs will hold the arrow from pulling out of the fish and you can retrieve it by the string. 
or to retrieve an item you have out in an area that you do not want to expose yourself to, you have the chance to lob this arrow over the item, pull it across the item, and again try to catch these barbs on the item and pull it to you, or else literally shoot the item and these barbs will catch in it and not pull free so that you can pull it to you. This right here is using your imagination in the kitchen. I have an arrow point here that is made out of a fork and this fork is bent and the end of the arrow shaft has been whittled with a pocket knife and this is just a strong piece of uh, carpet and button thread to lash it on there nice and straight and that gives you a point that could be used for shooting frogs, fish, or whatever. The other end of the handle on this same fork I lashed it to the end of the shaft the same way. I have a nice tapered transition right here. No humps or bumps to catch and impede penetration. I have the edges of this fork handle sharpened with a file to an extremely sharp edge and this makes a very effective hunting head. This here is a small game point, a bludgeon point if you will, and this is nothing more than a piece of wire that is wrapped around the end of an arrow shaft and it is wrapped tight enough to kind of take a bite into the wood and to lightly tap on that with a small hammer it is meshed down to where you cannot pull this off the shaft it makes a very sturdy very heavy small game point this right here is a small game point that has been made by taking a shell casing and putting it over top of an arrow shaft this is a time-honored way of making a blunt I have kicked it up a notch by taking a roofing nail and from the inside putting that through the primer hole. So this gives you a point that to uh, take a small game animal, a lot of times a blunt that gets a glancing blow at a rabbit or a squirrel just doesn't quite do the job. But having this nail that will penetrate the hide, it allows the point to get a better bite on that animal and deliver a blow that is sufficient to uh, subdue that animal. The last point that I want to show you is absolutely my favorite. I'm really in the primitive archery. This is a point that's been used by Eskimos and different Native American tribes for thousands of years. This is nothing more than a wood narrow shaft at the point has been sharpened and fire hardened and we have four sticks lashed on in a cross hatch type of configuration and this allows you to turn a near miss into a solid hit on a bird and allows you to subdue that bird and bring it to hand to be utilized as a food source. I'm now going to turn these shafts around and we're going to take a look at the knock end and discuss some ways of creating a knock and some fletching on these shafts. I want to discuss with you for just a minute the, uh, the knock end of the arrow, which if we're making arrows under primitive conditions, a survival scenario with objects at hand, one of the biggest hurdles to overcome is how to get a real nice knock on the end of your arrow shaft to accept your bowstring. What we're used to seeing here is a notch cut in the back of the shaft. This can be achieved with a small rat tail file, a nail file, a knife, a sharp rock, a hacksaw blade. If you have the tool, you can create this knock slot. If you have nothing to work with except maybe a pocket knife or even a situation where you're grinding this wood on a stone. This is a way of creating a knock that we might not be as used to seeing. I have taken the back end of my arrow shaft and I have created 
two flats and then I've taken two pieces of stick and flattened them and lashed them to the back of the arrow shaft to create a knock slot. This is very effective if you, for example, are using a piece of paracord for a bowstring, that paracord is pretty large in diameter compared to a bowstring. Also, if you're making a bowstring out of cordage made from natural fiber, that string is going to have to be pretty thick to withstand the stress of being used for a bowstring. So if you have limited tools or you're using a larger diameter material for your bowstring, this technique of lashing two sticks or pieces of bone on either side of the back of your shaft to create a knock is very effective. So just keep this in mind for future use. All right, as far as fletching goes, you can get away with shooting an arrow with no fletching. The heavier the point is, the less fletching you need. But obviously, some type of fletching to create some resistance at the back end of the shaft is going to keep the shaft flying straight, it's going to stabilize the shaft, and make for a more accurate shooting situation. There's a multitude of different ways of making fletching on a primitive arrow in the field. I'm going to show you the two that's the most effective and requires the least amount of uh, materials and tools. Feathers obviously make a great fletching, but we do not have to be master aerosmiths to use feathers to fletch an arrow. These are just two small bird feathers. There has been absolutely nothing done to them other than they have been lashed alongside the shaft. The only thing you have to watch doing this is this transition right here needs to be nice and smooth so that when that is shot across your hand it doesn't catch and pull and drag and cut uh, the tops of your knuckles and your fingers. But just laying two feathers alongside the shaft and lashing them down is very effective. You'll see on YouTube videos and various books a lot of times people recommend using duct tape or tape. Yes and no. That will create a decent fletch, but it's very hard to shoot that across your hand or off the shelf of your bow without a jumping and bumping and kind of hurts accuracy. The other option here that I like really well, this is nothing more than a, uh, these are strips torn off of a handkerchief. And I've got two little bundles of strips of handkerchief lashed to the back of this arrow. This creates a very effective fletching. It's real easy on your hands. It's got a lot of give to it when you shoot it. And it creates a very effective fletching. So these are just two examples of ways that I would recommend fletching an arrow in the field with a limited amount of time, resources, and materials. I hope you have enjoyed tonight's segment of the SOS Summer of Survival webinar series where we have discussed does archery have a place in a survival or preparedness situation. My name is Scott Moore from Whack Outdoors. It has been an honor and a privilege to share this information with you tonight.